Thanks everyone for coming. If you can all hear me at the back over there. <laughs> um, thanks so much. This is um, a, a sort of educational dimension to the gallery that we, that we have called Tuesday Talks. And um, we organize panel discussions and uh, talks that are generally connected to the exhibitions that are on at the time. We are currently in our Pearl Fine retrospective show, which is the first one in Europe. So we're very proud of that. Um, and we're working very closely with the Pearl Fine Estate, which is where the, all the works in the show have come from. Um, and we're going to talk a bit about Pearl Fine, but we're also going to talk more broadly about the sort of context around Pearl's work. So we're going to talk a bit about European influences of American abstraction. We're going to talk a bit about the role of women artists during the sort of 40s and 50s, um, as well as sort of, you know, deep going into, into more detail about Pearl's um, work. We're incredibly privileged to be joined by two behemoths of the art world. <laughs> um, uh, we have Daniel Zamani of the uh, Barberini Museum. Daniel received his PhD in the history of art from Trinity College, Cambridge. Uh, from 2015 to 2017, he was the assistant curator of modern art at the Stadel Museum in Frankfurt. In 2018, he joined the Curatorial Museum at the Barberini Museum. And the current show, which links beautifully to our exhibition, um, is called The Shape of Freedom, International Abstraction After 1945, uh, which has just opened and examines the flowering of radical post-war abstraction from a transatlantic perspective. Uh, the 97 works by 52 artists include Pearl Fine, um, her work, Early Morning Garden, alongside numerous key pieces by other women who were part of the uh, abstract expressionist movement. Uh, we're also very privileged to be joined by Jennifer Higgy. Um, Jennifer is an Australian writer who lives in London. She is the former editor of Freeze magazine and the presenter of a fantastic podcast called Bow Down, which definitely everyone should um, check out, it's brilliant, about women in art history. Um, among many things that you've done, she's also been the judge of the Paul Hamlin Award, the Turner Prize, the John Moores Painting Prize and a number of advisory boards of Arts Council England, the British Council, Venice Biennial Commission, the Contemporary Art Society and the Imperial War Museum Art Commission Committee. Her latest book, The Mirror and the Palette, Rebellion, Resilience and Resistance, 500 Years of Women's Self-Portrait, is published by Winefield and Nicholson. Uh, and that's out now. You can definitely, you must go out and buy that. Uh, she's also currently working on a book about women, art, and the spirit world. And I've got here, she also writes screenplays too, just to add on, <laughs> as if you weren't like busy enough. Um, and I'd like to sort of start off um, really by asking the question of Daniel. So how um, was, how was Pearl Fine's work, uh, did that become visible to you? And can you tell us a bit more about why her work was included in your exhibition that's currently on at the moment? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a brilliant show. Congratulations. Thank you. And I mean, it's, it's kind of subtitled um, a Rediscovery, the, our talk tonight. And I think that aspect of discovery or rediscovery was something that was very much on my mind in, in uh, my exhibition. Um, you said it, we, we show 52 positions. It's um, transatlantic abstraction. And when I started working on the show in 2018, one of the questions I had in mind is how can we deal with a canon? Sort of, it's a narrative we think we know, but it's sort of few positions that are well represented in, especially in, in German museums. And I think most people, when they think about abstract expressionism, they think they kind of know the story. It's an all American boys club, it's Pollock, it's Newman, it's Rothko, it's the Koning. And actually, when you go back in history and you look at the exhibition catalogs of the big shows from the 1940s and the 1950s, we have all of these names by women who aren't in any big museum collections. There's hardly any retrospectives on them. And I think we're in a really exciting moment when they're being rediscovered and reclaimed by art history. And it's kind of crazy that it's taken so long. If you think like the beginnings of uh, feminist art history in the 1970s, 1980s, people like um, uh, Grisella Pollock, of course, uh, Linda Nochlin, you know, so much amazing scholarship and it's taken us such a long time for this process of reclaiming, rediscovering. And um, Fine was someone who just struck me as an incredibly gifted and talented painter, very powerful works. And I discovered her through the um, show at the Denver Art Museum in 2016, which included her work. 
And so it was important for me to include one painting by her with limited space, we show 97 pieces. But um, at the third iteration of the exhibition, which will be in Oslo next year, I think she will be represented much better with four pieces. And I think that aspect of sort of rediscovery is also something that's very much on your mind. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I, I think the, the question of why someone as talented as Pearl Fine, who's been excluded from the canon, despite the fact that she had so many shows. I mean, she's a new discovery for me too. You know, I feel ashamed that I didn't know more about her. And like delving into her, her history now, since I've been introduced to this wonderful work, it was like, oh my God, you know, she had 25 museum shows and solo shows and, you know, she was moving in all the right circles. And so what happened then? Why was she sort of excluded from the canon? And I'd love to hear your take on that actually. Yes, and I mean, if we maybe some look at some of the slides here we've mm. prepared, um, it's, it's just like a, a little um, selection of some installation shots from the, the exhibition we're currently mm. in. It's an incredibly multifaceted oeuvre that she has. She constantly mm. reinvented herself. Mm. It's interesting that she doesn't have that signature style, which mm. I think might have contributed towards the fact mm. that she remained overlooked. Because mm. when you think of people like, I mean, Rothko certainly, Newman, still in the 1940s, 1950s, mm. I think what we see is that they kind of find a signature style mm. that's also very marketable. Mm. They have a brand you immediately recognize a, a kind mm. of mature Rothko and mm. find kind of constantly recreates herself. And you see it in the exhibition with sort of, um, she's not just a painter, she experiments with etching and, and with collage, so it's uh, very multifaceted. And I think maybe that's mm. also one of the aspects that makes it more difficult for mm. other historians and curators to frame her work. Mm. And here, of course, uh, we have sort of one of these great studio portraits of her, and um, it's, it's really fascinating, I think, that even such a small retrospective mm. this one shows you how much there is to rediscover in her mm. work. Yeah. But, um, of course, you know, being a woman in the 50s and being a woman artist in the 50s, she was up against a very macho milieu, and I think that's really interesting about abstract expressionism, too, that we think about it as a sort of Jungian, primal, male, and very white male as well, you know, gestural um, form of art making, when, in fact, there were so many women around the time who were making, you know, there were so many abstract expressionist women. Um, and, you know, all of them were, to various degrees, part of the conversation. Of course, two of the big ones were married to very big male painters as well. Lee Krasner is married to Jackson Pollock um, and Elaine de Kooning is married to Willem de Kooning. But, you know, they were up against an, an art history that was being written at that point to the exclusion of, of their talents. You've got, you know, the, we were talking about this before, the, you know, the two major 20th century textbooks were, were Gombrich and Janssen, both wrote mm. respectively their histories of art, you know, which I studied when I was at art school. And in their first editions in the late 50s and early 60s, they didn't include one woman in their history of art. Like, women were literally written out of the story, which is, you know, apart from anything else, it's, it's bad scholarship. Clement Greenberg, who was the major abstract expressionist, you know, champion, he, um, he did include some women in his exhibitions and his books, but essentially he was, he was quite aggressively anti-women in, in many ways. He was constantly putting women down. I found a quote about um, Joan Mitchell, um, you know, fantastic painter, and she had um, an exhibition in Paris, and uh, basically um, uh, Greenberg closed it down. Um, and she said, I felt, you know, when I was discouraged, I wondered if really women could not paint the way all the men said the women could not paint. But then at other times I said, fuck them. So, you know, she, that's why she kept painting. But, um, mm -hmm. I mean, what do you see as the sort of, do you see structural reasons for their exclusion as well as facts, like with Pearl Fine? I mean, we, we tend to know artists now like Helen Frankenthaler mm -hmm. and Joe Mitchell, but maybe with Pearl Fine, she was exclude because she's not as recognizable as, say, a Rothko. She didn't have a signature style. She was restless and, mm. yeah. Yeah, and I think the fact that she was a woman certainly played mm. a big, big role in the sort of very much mm. of discourse that when the historical view on abstract expressionism is born, mm. I think, I mean, Irving Sandler's book, The Triumph of American Painting, I think published in 1970. Mm. It's amazing now when you read it, how he sort of gets around all of the fantastic women artists in the movement. It's like he, mm. I think he, sort of Krasner is kind of Pollock's wife. I think he mentions Helen Frankenthal and mm. John Mitchell, but there's not much in-depth discussion at all of any mm. of the women painters. Mm. And it's kind of very much structured around these male artist geniuses. So I think this mm. idea of, you know, the, the kind of uh, much vibe, it was even reinforced by art historians. 
Mm. And I think when you look at the movement as such, yes, there was this kind of much also drinking culture, mm. uh, you know, that all hung around at the Cedar Bar, and a lot of the women actually said in retrospect it was very hard for them being mm. sort of taken as an equal. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, like, I mean, the Koning is a good example because he invited Fine to be mm. part of the 8th Street Club in 1949. She was mm. very active in all of these discussions. She really was at mm. the center of what was happening in the art world, but then she was mm. written out of history. Mm. Mm. We talked. We had an interesting chat about what was what sort of pre just before the fifties, and actually there was in the sort of thirties and forties in the mm. states that did seem to be a kind of move towards a more f positive feminist kind of support mm. of women mm. artists. Can you tell us a bit about that? So it's not like the fifties came out of it, it was a big change, but mm. something occurred before that, and over that decade the erosion and the, eras the erasure of these artists from mm. the history seem mm. to occur during that 50s period somehow. Mm. Um, well, can, you t can you tell us a bit more about the yeah. kind of 30s women colleges maybe and yeah. the artists that were supported yeah. at that time? I mean, uh, I think we should also mention too that, you know, as we talked about before, you know, history is messy, humans are messy. Things, sometimes we expect art history to, you know, move forward in a linear way that one movement segues neatly into another and, you know, everyone fits into a box. And of course, it's never like that. Um, Art is a product of humans, and humans are irrational, they're messy, they turn back on themselves, they can be ill-defined, all the rest of it. But what happened with women artists in the 1930s? Finally, you know, after literally thousands of years of not being able to study or not being able to study life, life models or to be accepted into academies or to have apprenticeships or to um, have some political agency, finally they had all of this. They had access if, you know, given the right circumstances, they had political agency and they had access. And so there was a huge flowering of, you know, women artists in the 20s and 30s once women started getting the vote and started, you know, demanding their independence. And um, the women's colleges in America, and especially, you know, colleges like Bennington, you know, they were really feminist and they were, you know, they instilled in their female students that, you know, they could do absolutely anything. And so you see that a lot of the women artists from, um, you know, the really prominent women artists, they went through a lot of this college system that instilled in them this sense of can do. Of course, then the war happens and a lot of the men especially are sent off to war. And a bit like after the first world war when, you know, the men are off and so the women have to, you know, run the place and which results in things like women being granted the vote not long after the first world war. You know, in America, you know, once America entered the war, women stepped up and they were, you know, work, working as, you know, in all, all the jobs that men do. And, um, you know, this instilled a great sort of sense of possibility among, among women and women artists. But then, of course, the 50s came and the men were back from the war and there was this sense of, okay, well, women can go back into the kitchen. And, you know, we've all seen Mad Men. We've all seen, you know, what it's like to be a woman trying to achieve, you know, creative greatness at a time when, everything is being stacked against her, even though ostensibly she's meant to have political agency. You know, she is, she's being written out of the story from all corners of the field, you know. So women who achieved greatness at this time, you know, they really did, they were very powerful women. I mean, there are, I've, there, I've just got a couple of little quotes here just to give you a sense. Um, uh, for example, Grace Hartigan, who was one of the great um, abstract expressionist women, she was probably the first one to achieve, you know, proper fame. And she signed her paintings as George for a long time until she gained confidence as both a woman and an artist. And in 1950, she painted um, a really important painting for her, which is The King is Dead, which is her, you know, in a sense, claiming her name as Grace, as a woman, and saying, you know, the king is dead. The king... I am a woman, I cannot be a king, but I can achieve greatness as an artist. And I think that's, you know, really important. And, you know, you've got, um, you've got um, Joan Mitchell saying, you know, almost resisting her gender or saying that she'd become something else. She says, I become the sunflower, the lake, the tree, I no longer exist. Um, you know, and uh, Clement Greenberg, he's, he went out with, he had a relationship with Helen Frankenthaler for five years, you know, and she, in a sense, invented colour field painting. And, um, you know, he never really acknowledged her role in that, um, in his writing about colour field paintings, you know, and this was, 
Um, and there was, wait, I've got another one up here. Oh, and of course, a famous one was Lee Krasner. A lot of them studied under Hans Hoffman. And, uh, you know, Lee Krasner, Krasner is a great painting. And he famously said to her, um, this is so good, you would not believe it was done by a woman when she was, she was at art school. Um, there were some, oh, God, there were so many, um, so many of these quotes. I'll, I'll stop there, actually, because I'll just go on. But, um, of course, Alfred J. Barr, the founder of the Museum of Modern Art in 1936 in his um, Cubis, Cubism, Cubism and Abstract Art Show, you know, he, he had, I think there were 200 artists in that or something like that, and they were, he included, I think, three women in that show. You know, women were constantly being written out of the story despite the fact that they were always making and they were always present and they were always there. So, mm -hmm. And there were fewer of them than men, granted, because they were up against so much, but they were there. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting you bring up Hans Hoffman and maybe mm. something uh, where you can come in here a little bit, Daniel. So, so it mm. seems like, you know, Pearl's parents were, Ru were Russian immigrants. She, she, Pearl was born in the States, but, um, you know, she was a first generation um, European immigrant. And, you know, Hans Hoffman was this key European figure that was very influential of, uh, over um, American artists at that time. Mm. Pearl was also worked very closely with uh, Mondrian as well. Mm. And I'm wondering, um, I've, I always imagined, sort of before looking into it with any depth, that the Abex canon was all about America. It's like mm. a, apple pie and Coca Cola and Mickey Mouse, really, you know, this sort of symbol of a free society and mm. a, a, mm. some sort of like. Uh, um, societal like trope this is represents what america represents was about freedom and in opposition to sort of communism in the sort of yeah in, from the 50s onwards i suppose um and so i just wonder daniel whether you can talk a bit more about the kind of european influences of american abstract mm. artists and then what was kind of happening outside of america at the same time because so i was very struck by your exhibition Mm -hmm. to, to learn about artists that I wasn't aware of in like Germany and France and Italy and places like that. Yes, I mean, I think it really interlinks with what you were saying about women artists and the process of conscious exclusion, because uh, what I realized in the show as well is that this idea of being all American is something we need to problematize. I mean, there's a lot of them were immigrants or the children of immigrants. And this experience, I think, as well, of having migration in your family that was often linked to persecution. A lot of them were of Jewish origin, a lot of them were from Eastern Europe. And uh, I think, especially here in Europe, we don't realize that because uh, of the name changes. But um, I mean, uh, for instance, in my exhibition, I opened it with a painting by uh, Janice Biala. Mm. Um, and it, it was a very conscious curatorial choice that we didn't start with a Pollock. So when you come to the room, you see that wonderful painting by a woman artist that I think pretty much no one who goes to our museum mm -hmm. in Potsdam will have known. And the Pollock is, is on the left. And uh, Janice Biala was uh, very successful in the 1940s in, in Paris and in New York. Um, but she had actually been born as Shinhai Tvarkovska in Poland, which then was part of the Russian Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, she was Jewish in the 1930s. She was in Paris. Then she had to, of course, escape back to America when the Nazis came to power. Um, and she's one of these many Eastern European uh, women immigrants who shaped uh, American postal abstraction. And you find that there's a lot more dialogue going on between mm. uh, Europe and America, and also this construction of um, abstract expressionism as being this great American, all American mm. movement. It's something that happens in history of the time of the Cold War, mm. and when there's a very specific type of abstract expressionist painter being promoted, and he's white, and he's male, and he's all American, not a migrant. And mm. I found that incredibly interesting. Mm. And I think it, it might be a good moment to mention Janet Sabel, you know, who, um, because Janet Sabel, she also came as a refugee to, she was Jewish, um, Ukrainian. Um, she came with her family as a child. I think she was 14 when she came over. And, you know, she, she's really fascinating because she wasn't part of the sort of bohemian milieu. She um, was, uh, she had five children, her um, husband supported the family, and she just started experimenting with materials around the house. As we were talking before, there was, there was a great photograph of her with a vacuum cleaner, and she's put it on the reverse, so it's blowing paint over the surface. Anyway, in 1945, she makes a rather remarkable trip painting think of Jackson Pollock, she's making it before he makes his first strip painting in, in 1945, which is called The Milky Way, which is now in the Museum of Modern Art. And um, Jackson Pollock saw this painting and it influenced him. And actually I wanted to read out um, 
Clement Greenberg again. <laughs> yeah, the great old Clement Greenberg. <laughs> um, you know, once again, um, rather dim diminishing the achievements um, of a woman. So he, he wrote about, um, he wrote here, um, so he's writing in his 1955 essay, American Type Painting, um, and he recounts, I mean, he's making very clear here, it's not, it's not ambiguous, and he writes, and just be aware of the language of how he talks about this really brilliant painter. Back in 1944, this is Clement Greenberg writing, he, Jackson Pollock, had noticed one or two curious paintings shown at Peggy Guggenheim's mm -hmm. by a, in inverted commas, primitive painter, Janet Sobel, who was and still is a housewife living in Brooklyn. Pollock and I myself admire these pictures rather furtively. They showed schematic little drawings of faces almost lost in a dense tracery of thin black lines lying over and under a mottled field of predominantly warm and translucent color. The effect, and it was the first really all over one that I'd ever seen. Oh, the effect was that it was the first really all over, you know, which was Jackson Pollock's idea of all over. Later, Pollock admitted that these pictures had made an impression on him. You know, so, uh, you know, as Daniel was saying, that this idea of it being a, you know, a white macho American um, way of re representing the world is false, you know, and of course you've got all the emigres coming from Europe, you know, you've got Mondrian and Kandinsky and all these people coming over to, to New York and bringing their very European ideas, which obviously influence, I mean, look at de Kooning, you know, mm. um, coming over. And so it's, it's a much messier tale than is assumed. Yeah, yeah. and I, mean, I think that's a really important point as well, that it's not mm. just, uh, the, the, the idea of the, the, the immigrants, but also of the art that's there. I mean, mm. Greenberg, I think that, that's a very valid point he made. He's saying, you know, the Americans were in the 1940s, the mm. abstract expressionists, when they hadn't sort of made their mark yet. They, I think he phrased it like they would have known their provincial fate awaiting them because America mm. had never produced avant-garde mm. of global importance. Mm. But what was really a game changer was when all of the great European art was bought by American institutions. They had the Museum of Modern Art opening in 1929. Mm. Museum of Non-Attractive Painting, which is now the Guggenheim, I think in 1939. Mm. Peggy Guggenheim opening a gallery out of the century in 1942, mm. I believe. And she's, of course, interesting because she shows a lot of women artists. Mm. It's not a commercial mm. gallery. Guggenheim is rich. So mm. it's interesting as well that she gives more space to women, like uh, to mm. Janet Sobel, for instance. But you, of course, see it also in the art. I mean, this is an early find from 1945, uh, one of the few paintings by her now in the collection of an important American museum. Mm. And you can really see how she's very much looking at Miro at that time. And it's typical, of course, for um, the abstract expressionists mm. in the 1940s. They all go to the Museum of Modern Art. Mm. They all go to the Museum of Knowledge Protective Painting. And they're all studying Kandinsky, Miro. Mm. They all look at Picasso, at Matisse. And I think what's happening a bit is that it really changes because it's not Paris any longer that's this powerhouse, but New York becomes as good because they have all of the collections, they've got all of the mm. teaching. And it's interesting, of course, also that Hoffman uh, emigrates to the United States in 1932. And a lot mm. of the abstract expressionist artists actually take classes from them. They work through European modernism and then arrive at their own mm. idiom later. Mm. And also, Hila Ribe is an interesting one to, woman to mention as well. She was the, um, she, she's a really fascinating character. So she was an artist. I think she was a, a countess or a baroness. And, and she comes over to New York from Germany. I think it was Germany in the 30s, and she becomes the main advisor to Solomon, Solomon Guggenheim um, in terms of, and so she's the first director of, of the Guggenheim, which was, what was it, the Museum of Non-Objective? Yeah, and so she becomes the director of that, and she, the first exhibitions of that, she's, she plays Beethoven and burns incense and, you know, while, during the exhibitions. But, you know, so she's bringing her very, and she was close to Kandinsky, and that's why the Guggenheim has so many Kandinskys as well, because she was, you know, advising Solomon Guggenheim to buy all of these incredible European artists, and that's why they ended up in New York. So, you know, you've got a, a German woman artist who's, you know, I mean, it's messy. <laughs> and it's, I think, also interesting that you look at the beginnings in the 1940s, because it seems to me when you look at a lot of the interviews with the women artists, they're saying when they're starting out, gender didn't make such a big difference. It's more of a project space. I mean, the 9th Street exhibition, I think, is a good example. Yeah. There is like in the beginning of the 1950s, there's not much money. They're not commercially so successful yet. So the artists really band together as a collective. Mm. So lots of women being shown and they're kind of being perceived as equal by the public. Mm. And what changes, I think, is when they become marketable and when it's galleries who want to mm. sell, they just think it's a lot easier to sell paintings than men. Mm.
Mm. And I think that's mm. really a point where you have the gallerists as a gatekeeper mm. as well. Mm. I mean, one of them being Betty Parsons, which mm. is kind of interesting. So obviously she was running a commercial gallery. Mm. And um, yeah, there's a fantastic archive you can access through the Smithsonian website, which is definitely worth um, checking out. Um, but I think, yeah, so I think Peggy, um, uh, I think Betty Parsons was showing predominantly male artists, mm. although she was supportive of Pearl for probably six or seven years, and she's, mm. Pearl certainly did several exhibitions um, at Betty Parsons Gallery. Mm. Um, but it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because she, she you know, Betty Parsons is, is a, a lesbian, you know, she's a solo woman, mm. she's, you know, one of the most powerful galleries in New York, and you would expect a bit of sisterhood. And she did show Pearl, but then there are other stories of, like, she refused to do a studio visit with Lee Krasner, because she told, because Jackson Pollock asked her to, and she said, oh, no, I don't deal in married couples. Mm. And so there is this idea that, whereas Peggy Guggenheim isn't dependent on the money from the gallery, Betty Parsons is, you know, she needs to make money to run this gallery. Mm. So there might have been that aspect to it too, that she's just being a hard-nosed businesswoman as well. Yeah, mm. yeah. So fascinating, like correspondence between mm. Pearl Fine and Betty Parsons on this, um, yeah, on this uh, archive. Mm. Um, I think one of the things that attracts me to Pearl's story and her work was this kind of like insatiable kind of um, approach to painting mm. and how she was able to reinvent mm. her work and her practice and, and, re remain, and remain sort of relevant but also challenge herself mm. as an artist. And I get a sense that that's quite unusual, particularly of artists from that sort of, mm. um, from that era. Um, one of the things that I find uh, really exciting is, is after the 50s, is, there's not like tons of, there's a few um, interviews with Pearl that you can check out online. One of the things she talked about, the, um, the atmosphere of, of the art scene in the, towards the end of the 50s being mm. something that was very kind of toxic to her. You know, she, mm. she was very resistant to this idea of competition among artists. She's someone who was, came from the, that sort of 30s background mm. and there were kind of more socialist programs instigated by the government like were artist work programs in the 30s, things like that. Um, and so she left New York in the late 50s and then returned in the early 60s to a very, very different scene and with a completely new um, body of work. And I'm just wondering if, if that's an unusual thing for artists to do or whether that feels like something that more artists you would have thought would do in, in terms of like reinventing the way they work. And if you have any thoughts on that particular aspect of Pearl's practice. I don't know. I mean, in, in some ways, it's a very sort of postmodern practice, isn't it? Mm, I mean, I remember, yeah. you know, with a lot of 80s painting, artists were changing their style and their mood mm. quite radically because they were, you know, questioning the idea of authorship and, you know, all the rest of it. So, um, you know, in, in a way, it was a very radical thing to do, but I don't think it's that common. Usually, mm. you could, I mean, obviously, you've got artists like Philip Guston who go from being an extraordinary abstract artist to an extraordinary figurative artist, but that was, you know, people would cross the street and not talk to him for doing that. You know, mm. I mean, that was an extremely radical and frowned upon gesture, really, that he made, wasn't it? So, mm. but that. I mean, it's hard to think of other examples of artists who, I mean, obviously, of course, you've got a Picasso who changes styles all the time, mm. but um, he was extremely prolific, obviously, as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, what do you think about that? I mean, I think a good person to compare to is, is Lee Krasner, who was also crazy mm. about sort of reinventing herself and like, um, constantly also like having that mind of a student. And I think when you see Pearls, mm. like I think she's kind of like someone who's always grappling with the same ideas and the same questions, but she kind of finds very different solutions. I mean, I find it fascinating, in, in, even in this retrospective, if you look at the different works, you wouldn't necessarily think it's by the same artist at right, all. Yeah. And sometimes it's just 10 years and you think she's going from this crazy one thing to the other. But then the closer you look, the more you see that there's mm. still a sense of écriture, I think you could say, right? She has kind of a, let's say an obsession with specific things. I think, for instance, like you're interested in Mondrian mm -hmm. and, and the, the structure of the grid is something you see in the early works. I mean, later when, mm -hmm. when she has these paintings that are very close to Agnes Martin, it's more visible. But I think even in a piece that's sort of very cubist in style like this one, mm -hmm. you can see there's the kind of Mondrian lurking in the background mm -hmm. and also how she was constantly going back to nature as an inspiration. Mm -hmm. But um, What do you think were the main questions she was grappling with? I think it's order and balance in, in mm. her work, really, and, and that's something that comes on in a lot of the um, uh, her own sort of uh, mm. remarks about her uh, painting and 
I think it's a bit like Frankenthaler who once famously said, you know, um, it doesn't really matter if you paint a tree or if you make an abstract composition, it's a painting that works. Mm. And I think, you know, does the painting work structurally? Mm. Mm. Is it balanced? That's something you even find in the sort of more gestural work in the early mm. years. I mean, these are obviously um, kind of a bit surrealist inspired, right? Um, when you have these um, compositions here, where you see mm. these kind of freely uh, flowing forms. Yeah. But um, mm. it's, it's interesting, I think, that kind of does the painting work, is there balance in the composition? It's something that I find mm. that really mm. defines fine as a painter. Mm. Mm, absolutely. I wonder if we can skip down to some of the cool series paintings. Just I mean, sort of George, you've been, you know, living with these paintings for yeah. a while now. Mm. What do you see as the question she's been, you know, I think her, her sort of core exploration? Yeah, I mean, I think really I'll echo what Daniel was saying, you know, mm. I've, I've, and having kind of researched into trying to find interviews with her, trying mm. to, you know, hear her talking about her own work. You know, she does talk about the quality of the painting is the thing that she is trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. You know, that is that's her obsession. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the kind of formal, like, tropes around that in terms of composition, balance, uh, and, uh, you know, color, sensitivity towards color mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, you know, she talks about trying to make good paintings. That's one thing that keeps coming up in, in mm. interviews and, and that she seems a bit kind of confused that people kind of keep asking her like, why, mm. <laughs> why have you done this cool series thing? And it's like, mm. well, you know, I was trying to make good paintings in the 40s as well. Mm. It's just with, with a different sort of language around that, I think. And uh, actually, could you talk a bit, because you know more about this than I do, about the, when she destroyed her show, her whole yeah, show? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great sort of, um, yeah, great example of sort of Pearl's character, I think. Mm. So, so she'd, by the early 60s, she had moved out of New York City and she was living in, um, you know, upstate and she had this wonderful um, studio there. And she was um, invited to do an exhibition at a gallery in New York in six, 1964. Four, I think that's when the first cool series paintings were presented, and so the um, you know conversations we, between her and the gallerists was was sort of going on for a year or so. She made a whole body of work which she then destroyed because she just felt like she'd moved on from you know the work that she was making in the fifties, mm. and to reconnect with the art world in the sixties in New York, which had a very different vibe about it. You know that was one of the things I think that gave her the opportunity to try this completely different body of work. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's again one of those sort of personal things that, that draws me back to, to Pearl's work generally. Um, you know, I remember like sort of critiques at art school, you know, we'd never talk about the market. It was always, we were always talking about what our mm. ideas were behind the work and deconstructing mm. what was in front of us. And there was not conversations about like, well, who are you going to sell this to? How are you going to kind of develop the same mm. theme um, and and engage with with the market in that way? And I think she was, um, yeah, like a true sort of artist's artist. If mm. that doesn't sound too sort of um, mm. too cheesy, basically. I mean, I, I love this quote here because I think yeah. there's a lot of fine thinking on art, and you know, art of revelation which came about through endless probing, came the revolution, so you mm. can sense that kind of constant change. And then later she talks about a bell-like awakening and simplified work, so you see that idea of constant experimentation in her work. And I, I also think it's really interesting that she, she says sort of uh, the expression is more than merely chemical or optical, it is metaphysical, so mm. you, you really feel that she's in the discourse at the time, also of artists like Newman or Rothko, right? It's, it's mm. a lot about expression, it's about intersubjective communication, about really reaching out with a message to the viewer and constantly trying out how to find that kind of very personal art. You know, I mean, it's, mm. I think for me, what really finds abstract expressionism, because of course, formally, it's so different and I mean, even Alfred H. Barr very early on said, you know, it's kind of crazy. Why do we have one umbrella term? If you look at the work, they seem to have nothing to do with each other. Mm. But then one thing they were all very keen about is this, you know, painting the self and having someone reacting in a very kind of intuitive level to it. And I think that's something that she certainly went for in these um, uh, cool series paintings that we see here. And what was her relationship to Rothko at this stage? Did she have a relationship with him? Yeah, they were, they were really yeah. close. There's lots of pictures of them hanging out together. Mm. They were showing together in the 50s. Mm. And, um, you know, when we, we did an exhibition of the Cool series mm. uh, a couple of years ago, 
and the common sort of conversations that popped up were linked to Rothko, obviously, because mm. sort of structurally from a distance they look kind of similar. You've got mm. these similar shapes and kind mm. of colour and stuff. Um, but um, I mean, when you see them up close, they are very, very different painters actually, mm. and very different sort of things going mm. on in the work. But no, she knew Rothko. They were they were contemporaries, and um, there's a great picture of uh, hanging out with Rothko in the late 50s, so she had already left New York at this point. Whether she looked at Rothko's work and was like, I'm going to sort of, you know, have a go at one of those mm. or not. I don't know if it's sort of like that. Same like with Agnes Martin, you know, she was very close with Agnes Martin. They were, they were contemporaries really throughout both of their lives. Mm. And we've got a very sort of Agnes Martin mm. painting above the stairs from the late 70s. Um, but um, I don't get a sense that the inspiration came from other artists, in this case mm. particularly. I don't think it was about Rothko, really. Mm. Uh, there was perhaps a visual language that was emerging that she could kind of like engage with, which was about colour field painting. Mm. Um, uh, yeah. And in fine, also, there's, there's a lot of texture. I think she's, she's also an artist that doesn't reproduce uh, mm. very well. Yeah. It's like when, when you flick through catalogues, it's completely different than like even when mm. I came to the gallery early on, and I mean, I'd looked at so many of the images. And it's, it's a completely different world. She has so many like fine surface structures and I think that's also something that defines her. I think it comes from interesting collage that she's so interested in the plasticity of the surface. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean collage, you know, trying to, def yeah, trying to find a sort of defining look of pearls obviously is, is kind of a really difficult thing to do. But the collage works are really consistent throughout mm. her, her practice. It's kind of interesting mm. to look at those. in. Um, in isolation, and again, it's about working things out structurally. I think mm. you know, being able to do that with. So, what, what do you think she learnt from Mondrian? You know, so was she? What was she doing with Mondrian? She was his studio assistant, or that's right. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I mean, she was when she was when she was living in New York. She was obsessed mm. with sort of seeing the great masters of European mm. art, and I think Kandinsky and Mondrian certainly were sort of some of the key figures mm. she was looking at. And I think with Mondrian, it really was the idea of like structure with simplification mm -hmm. of colour and form, line being a defining feature. And it's interesting that in her work it comes out very late. Mm -hmm. So she goes through all these different phases. I think at the mm -hmm. beginning it's sort of very Cubist series inspired. Mm -hmm. And then it's really for me with the um, with the cool series and then later these works that are very sort of close to Agnes Martin mm -hmm. that you see how the grid becomes mm -hmm. really this sort of central organizing principle for her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in what ways do you think an artist is kind of held back by producing work in different ways and different styles. I, I would or say are they not? I, I don't think it, it was all the case with, with Fine. I mean, the interesting thing, if you think of a retrospective of her work and you see them in combination with each other, you just see that she's very much at the nexus and how many possibilities she has, how many influences mm. she can creatively assimilate. And it, it never looks like a painting mm. by someone else, right? Mm. I mean, this, you, you think, yes, maybe there are references to artists like Newman mm. or to Rothko, but I think she really gives it always her own stamp. So I don't mm. think it would have been a constraint for her at all to work in that extremely, like, um, you know, radically liberated environment. And I think New York in general, like after 1945, you know, it was just a center where you could really leave mm. a, uh, behind you the shackles of tradition and like find something new. And it's not a coincidence that she moves there. Mm. Mm. So really the only thing that sort of worked against her was the market on some level because mm. I mean I'm still I still don't fully understand why when she was showing so much and she seemed to be you know really in the thick of things why she then disappeared from the history books. Yeah I think it's sort of like I, d I don't know either it's sort mm. of baffling I mean I think there's a combination of perhaps her character mm. feeling a bit repelled by competing with other artists for, mm -hmm. and especially as, as money starts flooding into the, mm -hmm. as we, we sort of now live in the art market world mm -hmm. that we're all familiar with, but you know, mm -hmm. the Western world during the 50s was going through these great sort of, the beginnings of these great economic booms, which was reflected in the art market, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I don't know whether Pearl was like, a, competit a particularly competitive character, yeah. or that she was particularly interested in becoming, in selling tons of stuff mm. necessarily. Um, but yeah, I don't know, I find it, yeah, I find it really sort of mm. baffling as well. I mean, I think like what's positive is that definitely that is changing now, 
mm. you know, and, and for obviously for a period sort of after her death, maybe like 30 years or so, mm. she really was, her work was, really was quite in the wilderness, mm. you know, and, and people were not very familiar with it. But, you know, thanks to people like Daniel and yourself as well, you know, talking about Pearl's work and getting a sort of audience mm. interested in what she was doing is, um, yeah, something that's really been building up momentum in the last mm. couple of years, you know, mm. which is great. And then um, I, I'm interested in that moment when suddenly ab abstract expressionism becomes uncool. Yeah, right? Just like yeah. That. And suddenly it's pop and they're sort of sent out to the wilderness for a moment or... Well, I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Mm. I mean, I think it's also interesting with the idea that, you know, pop art kind of replaced or superseded abstract expressionism, mm. which in the case of many of the artists, mm. for instance, also in my exhibition, isn't the case at all because if you look at Lee Krasner, Sam Francis, Helen Frontenthal, I think mm. a lot of their strongest work mm. was produced relatively late, right? It's and great Mitchell stuff too, coming yeah. out in the 1970s yeah. or yeah, 1980s, true. and they, yeah. you know, some of them maybe have more of a signature style that are kind of um, continue to work in, like mm. Sam Francis, for instance. Mm. Uh, but I mean, Krasner, Frontenthal, it's crazy how they change in formats, the application mm. of color. So I think they really hold their own against hip hop mm. artists as well. And it's also something that needs to be revised in how we think of art history, just one movement. Superseding it's the not other. like one disappears they and another all replaces run it. Parallel yeah. and kind of overlap. There's a yeah. lot of kind of back and forth between them. Yeah. 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 I mean, like while our attention is sort of peaked by pop art, this mm. this stuff's still going on, mm. kind of thing. You know, it's just mm. we collectively focus on one, mm. you know, thing at a time, seem mm. to seemingly mm. culturally. Mm. Um, I mean, what I wonder with Fine is kind of where are we now? Because you had like, in, I think the Denver show was such an important event mm. with uh, showing women of abstract expression in 2016. Mm. And I think once museums kind of start, you know, mm. taking things back into the can, into the discourse, mm. it can really sort of kick off a, a huge mm. movement. And I find it interesting, of course, that she will be next year again here in London at the Whitechapel show on mm. uh, female abstract artists. So yeah. I wonder, you know, to what extent will museums follow with acquisitions? I find it crazy yeah. that the Museum of Modern Art doesn't have one single piece mm. by her, for instance. Mm. So I think this is a very exciting uh, moment now to watch for all of us. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting too to look at it in a very intersectional way in the, in the sense that it's not just women who are excluded too, it was artists of colour and, mm. you know, if you see like, uh, if you saw an exhibition like Soul of the Nation um, mm. that travelled recently uh, a few years ago um, of, of black artists and their contribution to 20th century, you know, modernism and the staggering amount of, you know, brilliant black men who are exploring this field as well, who are also written out of the canon. So. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, Frank Bowling mm. came out of college in the sort of 60s, mm. didn't he, in the early 60s. Mm. Mm. So at that point, abstract art was just like yeah. uncool, yeah. you know. And, um, but yeah, I mean, checking out his, his paintings in that, um, mm. that exhibition, they're absolutely, mm. you know, stunning. Mm. Uh, I mean, I think it's just probably one of those reality things that trends come and go, the, mm. the collective consciousness sort of focuses on one mm. thing and doesn't mean that the rest of the world doesn't exist at that mm. point. It's just kind of how we look back on history yeah. somehow, isn't it? And it just makes clear once again how, you know, the art history is a work in progress, you know. Right. It's not something that's fixed, you know, mm. it's, it's constantly evolving and expanding mm. and, you know, which is exciting, I think. It's not yeah. about, you know, excluding people who were important to these narratives. Right, yeah. 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 And, and also I think how it's, it's important, I think certainly for me as a curator, to say, you know, this is, exhibition is not a statement mm. on some sort of canon that should be constructed. It's one narrative, mm. it's one story we're telling, and mm. there are others that are equally valid, if you like. Yeah. But I think what's important is sort of going back to history, and I think it's even interesting if you think of terminology, are we expanding the discourse, are we going back to the right discourse? Because mm. a lot of the time it's just, you know, the women were in the discourse, so it's mm. not like we're expanding it. And also certainly with my show, people say, like, oh, you're trying to give it a feminist spin. I was like, no, I'm actually just trying to show good art by yeah. great artists, and yeah. a lot of them happen to be women. So mm. it's, uh, mm. you know, sort of going back to historical realities of abstract expressionism mm. as well. Mm. And, and I certainly think it, it's good that people now are very conscious of, you know, they have been omitted mm. by a masculinist discourse, and we need to deconstruct that discourse mm. and sort of gain a clear vision again. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I wonder whether we should ask, open up for a bit of a Q&A. What do you reckon? Has anyone got any 
questions out there you would like to ask <laughs> or contribute? Yes, please. was about any work this exhibition that really kind of sparked our interest mm. that we want to spend a lot of time in front of that maybe we had an emotional mm. response to I suppose. Mm. We were talking about this before when we were walking around. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I really like the um, the small work on paper just up here, the blue one. Sort of mm. it's, it's very sort of melancholy and it's got a lot of depth and there's something about that that I, I really enjoy. I mean I there's something in all of these pictures, I think, but I, I was particularly drawn to that one. Yeah, mm. yeah. I mean, I, I love the, the kind of yellow one just, just behind us here now, because mm. so, it's like, I think, very oneric atmosphere. Mm. It's think a bit like a surrealist piece that's kind of this mm. sort of dreamy nature scene. Mm. You're not quite sure what's going on, sort of very floating. And I think, mm. again, it's a piece where you see it is very free and it's very abstract, but there's also a real sense of sort of orderliness. So it's not too much abstraction, mm -hmm. but I think there's still some Kandinsky and Mondrian in it, yeah. how she tries to like find balance with how the, um, the shapes float. Mm. George, what's your What's, what's your my thought? favorite? You can take one home. Oh God, if I can take one home. I think it's the black and white um, collage mm -hmm. on the back there. Right. So it's this great work from 1959. Yeah. And it's a brilliant example of one of Pearl's collage pieces. And for some odd reason, she uses this plastic material mm -hmm. called it's some sort of melon melamine or something like that. And um, she did three of these different, three different collages, probably on the same day, you know, and used elements, the positive mm -hmm. and negative elements to create sort of three words. And um, yeah, why do I like it? It's just got a great energy. It's got a great attitude somehow. It's very kind of like strong, um, interesting work. And um, yeah, and I get sort of this, just this touch of this plastic on the top surface is kind mm. of something that I find very intriguing. Mm. Yeah, it's a good one. Mm. Yes. I think we sort of have a vision of artists as kind of rebellious figures, yeah. you know, who we, we want to be on the edge of something and send back this message from the edge um, that we can like have, you know, and, um, you know, part of that rebellious nature is not conforming, it's being a non-conformist sort of person who somehow um, on the edge and yet and yet the art world can be incredibly conservative and and uh, um, you know, Pearl was definitely someone who did her own thing, you know, and made work on her own terms, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, that's what I find really sort of fascinating. And I think we, we mentioned something earlier as well that's important, which is, I think, you know, yes, the odds were against her in some ways with, with being a woman artist in this still incredibly patriarchal society. It's interesting with her that her family were immigrants, were incredibly supportive from a very mm -hmm. early age. So she didn't have that typical, what a lot of women experienced, that the family was completely against it. You know, you absolutely can't become an artist when you're a woman. She was encouraged from early age on. She had a very supportive husband. She didn't have children, so she had a lot of time to paint. And it's again something I think that, you know, a lot of time people wonder like, oh, there's not that many good Mary Abbotts or that many great Janice Bialas. Why do the women not produce as much as the men? It's like, well, they usually did the housework. They usually were the ones looking after the children. So the constraints on time and if you like money and energy that the women, I think with Krasn as a brilliant example because mm. she was more famous than Jackson Pollock when the two of them met and then when Guggenheim finally gives him a huge stipend so he can move to this um, property on Long Island, 
he reconstructs the barn as this amazing studio with so much floor space and uses mm -hmm. it for his huge strip paintings. And I think Krasner, she had the shared small bedroom where she had to work. Right. So there's a reason why she makes these little images at the time. And I love the fact that when he dies, the first thing she does is she moves into the studio herself and suddenly her art like flowers. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mean, she would, I think she's a good example because she really comes into her own after Pollock's death. Mm. Mm. And it's fine, it's interesting that she at least at home didn't have these kind of constraints and also these rivalries. Mm. Was she financially restricted or not? I just wonder because women that made it, mm. were more or less like Pollock's family and Pollock's family was more secure. Yeah, it's a good question. We were talking about that before, weren't we? I mean, I don't, she certainly wasn't like from a wealthy family. She was teaching quite, I mean, she actually was teaching Cornell in the 50s and then went to Hofstra University in the early 60s. So she was teaching full time and earning money that way. I mean, yeah, she didn't have any kids. So, you know, she didn't. She didn't yeah. So that's also financially kind of beneficial. Um, and, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't think she came from like a really wealthy background. You know, parents fled Russia in the sort of turn of the century and then um, Maurice, her husband, um, was not a wealthy guy, particularly. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it, that com component is part of Pearl's story, particularly. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think she was just, yeah, given free money and, and all the rest of it. But the, the teaching, I think, is something that, that we should have probably also mentioned. Because yes, I think with, with Hoffman, I mean, he doesn't paint in, in a purely abstract idiom in the 1930s just the time when Fine becomes aware of him. I mean, I think he, his studio, uh, or the, the place where he taught, right, was, was, just, um, uh, was just around the corner from where she lived at that period. Um, but it's mm -hmm. interesting, I think, with Hoffman that teaching really helps him to reinvent himself. And I think it's also one of the things that's, that's key behind his sort of flowering in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. I think with, with Fine, it's also interesting if you think of her teaching period at that time, how she reinvents herself, because of course she has to think through a lot of mm -hmm. stuff that's going on, right? The moment when she has to transmit that knowledge to younger students. Mm. Mm. So it's a kind of, what you see is a kind of real restlessness in, she's like a scientist in a labor laboratory, mm. you know, she's tr trying out lots of different experiments to see what works. Yeah. And she was always pushing against the idea of prettiness or things being lovely, it mm. wasn't she? Yeah. she? She didn't like that idea, she, she was constantly pushing against her own facility for making a beautiful painting in a way. Mm. And I think also in terms of locations, I think that move from New York, is, it seems to be something that really helped her sort of being away from that sort of sometimes a very toxic and competitive art scene. So she had the space on her own. Then when she comes back for teaching, she's also at the hub. So I think mm. that's something really interesting mm. as well if you think of her work of the 1960s. Mm. 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 Thanks for the question. Thank you for introducing her to us. Yeah, she's a very incredible artist. And I hope it's not a trend of female artists becoming more and more acknowledged. I mean, I think that, that the question around sort of, I mean, look, Jennifer's here, she's the expert, about like women artists getting, being given more visibility, mm. sort of like in like, I don't know, recent years. Uh, I don't know, is that a problem if women are... So is your question more like, we don't want to see more women artists being referred to as just women rather than artists in their own right? As long as we see a name that is possible. Oh, I see. The numbers are still really embarrassing. The, work, the prices that are paid for the artists, like if you compare this painting and the price for this work yeah. to her sort of rivals at the time, not male. Oh, I mean, the amount of female artists at ocean houses is also it's, it's quite embarrassing to even hear. Um, so, but the illusion is there that they're coming out. So I don't know whether it's just a trend or whether oh, it's actually yeah. something no, that's changing. I think it's definitely it's changing, it's, but it's interesting that it often doesn't come from the big museums, and I think the institutions are often a bit locked by this idea of the canon and that they sort of represent taste and something that's established. So, you know, I mean, this Museum of Modern Art, what they should do is organize a big exhibition on Pearl Fine to rediscover it with like, you know, big amount of pieces, but it's sort of smaller spaces mm -hmm. like this one that actually dare bring these things out. And I think it's interesting, mm -hmm. even with my exhibition, I talked to lots of colleagues and it wasn't the big institutions that said, you know, put the no names in. 
but it was sort of gallerists and private collectors that were like, have you looked at Remington? Have you done your homework on Stern? Have you looked at Biala? And I was like, wow, these people. And then I sent me image material. I was like, wow, look at that. And sort of that's how, how I was able to do it because I had a lot of contact with people in the know, but it was more the private collectors with a real passion for it, or it was the gallery space. It's not the colleagues at museums because they were usually like, you know, stick to your Pollock, have a fifth Rothko. And, you know, what we try to do is mix it up. And the funny thing is the people kind of walking through it, it's tend to be the discoveries that people are really excited about because they've seen so many Rothkos, but the fine everyone is like, wow, this is a real discovery for us. Mm. And yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. But I think also though, um, you know, it's, there's been a lot of work around museums and gender equity plans, which have been, you know, brilliant. Like for example, um, my hometown in Australia, the National Gallery of Australia, they had a very important two-part exhibition called Know My Name, Australian Women Artists 1900 to 2000. And, you know, rather than just doing the exhibitions and letting things go back to normal, they actually, in, they drew up a gender equity plan that they have rolled out in the museum and that they are now sort of um, trying to get other museums around the world to sign up to. And they're having a great success with this, you mm. know, and it's about committing to increasing your acquisitions in terms of, you know, underrepresented women artists. It's about having a certain percentage of shows dedicated to women artists during the year mm. and, you know, all of that. And, you know, so I think change is happening, you know, but it's slow. I mean, you look at like, you know, last year or the year before when the National Gallery here had its it, our brilliant Artemisia Gentileschi show, you know, fantastic show. It's the first time the National Gallery here has devoted an exhibition to a historic woman artist. You know, I went to the Prado in, in um, Madrid uh, at the beginning of 2020 to see brilliant show of two Renaissance women artists, Sofonisba Anguissola and Lavinia Fontana. It was the second time in the Prado's 200 year history that they'd devoted an exhibition to women artists, you know. So it's slowly happening, but you know, it's not just about 20th century women, it's about like looking at women in the Renaissance, it's lo looking at Baroque women, it's looking at Mannerist women, it's looking, you know, women have always made art. And finally they're being you know, there's a recognition that, oh, there were women in the Renaissance, there were women, you know, mm. Etc. Etc. So, mm. you know, and that's exciting too. I think, mm. and uh, it's yeah. it, it's both a corrective and just an acknowledgement of, you know, a truer history than the one we've been told. Mm. So, yeah, it's important. Yeah. And I think what's also interesting, and, and where I think you know the battle will be won at the time when we don't need feminist causes anymore, mm. because it will have changed the discipline from within, and it's mm. just understandable. So, and. and uh, I also find it sometimes problematic when you have this framing of women, so it's like the idea, you know, put all of the sweetest women artists in this exhibition in one room, and then it's a room on women mm. artists. So, like, so they painted differently because of their gender. It's like yeah, they it's were ridiculous. on par with their male colleagues, and they, yeah. they all, like, like, responded to yeah. each other. So in my exhibition, I thought it was really important, you know, to show fine friends next to Pollock, Pollock mm. next to Solvo, sort of. And mm. I think when we're there, that they're just shown mm. together, and gender is irrelevant. Mm. I mean, that's, I think, somewhere we're still very far away from, mm. unfortunately. Mm. Especially also with sort of the bigger museums where there's a lot of institutional pressure on maintaining mm. a canon. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. Any more questions? Don't be shy. Jacqueline, you've always got a good okay. question in you. Um, I was just thinking because my father was an artist and uh, a master builder and an artist. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I got into some artists for art and design when I was 16, but I wasn't allowed to go. I had to go out and get a proper job. Mm -hmm. So that kind of, what you were saying resonated with me that even my mother said, well, hang on, your father had the opportunity to go to art school, but he won't let you go. And after thinking very carefully about what you just said, it was, was it to do with gender? Was it, he was a man so he could be an mm -hmm. artist, but as a woman, it was more of like a, mm -hmm. a pastime for me. Mm -hmm. He wasn't taken seriously. Mm -hmm. And I've never, until the things you just said, I've never really, Thought about it like that because mm. I just didn't understand why. I just thought mm. we were very poor, but I'm now starting to sort of mm. rethink that. Mm. So mm. that's been very helpful. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Perhaps, like to, to have a more optimistic note at the ending, I think the, the, the one thing that needs to also be said for abstract expressionism, at least there were a lot of women, and you can say there were a lot of great women artists. Because mm. what, what certainly struck me is if you look at, at New York at that time, it was possible to join these artistic movements to be shown in the Museum of Modern Art or the Whitney. I desperately try to find good uh, painters working now for male that are female. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that simply is not, I, I couldn't think of a single example of mm 
a woman artist in post-war Germany after the Nazis who had a big outcome of work. And I think it just shows that at least there was some awareness of America of the beginning of a feminist consciousness mm -hmm. and abstract expressionism very much reflects that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. It's been a, you know, battling through the uh, transport issues that are affecting <laughs> London today. And thank you both so much for joining us. It thank means you. a lot to us to have you, to have you both here. Thank so you thanks so for much. your time. Yeah. Thank you.